Friends, I'm going to read you a parable this morning in our series out of Matthew 22, or beginning at the first verse. It's another parable of uh, the, a banquet, another parable of the kingdom and judgment. It'll sound a little familiar because we've talked about a few of the parable the so banquets and judgment before this. We talked about another one, the very first one in this series. But this is different and has some different elements, and we're going to sort of pick those apart this morning. So we'll begin with Matthew chapter 22. We're going to go from verse 1 all the way through verse 14. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast. But they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized the servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry. He sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you can find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they had found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. He said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness in that place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, let me start this morning with a story that may or may not have anything uh, to actually to do with today's complicated parable. Um, way back when I was in middle school, I was part of an American Legion youth program. And often on Sundays, the leader would, uh, would take some kids with him out to run errands and do tasks. One Saturday, he told my friend and I that during our run, we would be stopping by a wedding reception for a friend's daughter named Catherine. So dress a little better than normal. So to us, that meant a clean shirt and 501 jeans. So we got to the place of the reception, and we found it was a golf club with multiple banquet rooms and several receptions going on. Our leader saw someone on the way and he needed to talk to, so he told us to go in, find a seat, and get some food. He'd be in there soon. So we went in and we looked for the sign that told you where, you know, which reception it was and what room, figured out the one we wanted, and, and we went in. We, we immediately realized we were underdressed in a room filled with suits and dresses. Undaunted, we filled our plates with food, found three seats, uh, and enjoyed the food. Now, our leader must have been having some kind of a conversation because he still wasn't there by the time I finished my plate. So I decided to get seconds. While in line, an older man next to me kind of leaned in close, and he pointed at the bride, and he says, Isn't she beautiful? That's my granddaughter, Stephanie. Remember, we were looking for Catherine. So I froze for a moment. And I stammered out, yes, she's beautiful. And I quickly went back to my seat, whispered to my friend, we're in the wrong reception. I'm leaving, follow me after a minute or two so it's not too obvious. Now, we did find the right room. We found our leader who was wondering where we'd been. And yeah, we ate again, but you know, we were growing boys. Uh, later, we talked about how glad we were that no one at the first reception found us out. So let me tell you, friends, when I read a parable about someone showing up to a wedding banquet, underdressed and out of place, it resonates with me. Reading Jesus' parable, apparently, I got off easy. You know, this is one of the hardest par of Jesus' parables to, to read and fully understand. One noted author, John Lambrecht, felt the nuss this quiet about the parable, the confess feeling that it should be ignored. Kyle Snodgrass, who I'll quote a few times, says, this parable does not sound like what we know about Jesus. So this is a hard one. Let me talk about some preliminary stuff. In our first sermon in the series, uh, we read a parable that was very similar in the Gospel of Luke. Some maintain that the parable in Luke and this one in Matthew are the same. 
simply have been altered uh, by each author for their purposes. But, but I, I don't think that's the case. There are significant differences in the parable. Uh, and both parables actually share very few words in, in Greek. So I think these are two similar parables spoken by Jesus on different occasions with somewhat different points being made. It's not grass notes, something I've said before. It's, is it not likely that Jesus spoke a given parable on a number of occasions and in different contexts, adapting it each time, perhaps, to the circumstance? A parable like that of the banquet, especially if it was a challenge to Jesus' contemporaries, may have been told numerous times in various places and forms. And I think, actually, really, this is just another reminder of how often Jesus must have spoke uh, about the kingdom of God, about judgment, and how we get into that kingdom. You know, and, and remember that most parables that have a great banquet in it are about God's people's eternal presence with God in the fullness of the kingdom after the final judgment. Now, some of the basics of this parable are not hard to understand. Try to figure out who, who Jesus is talking about. I mean, the, 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 the king is, is obviously God. The son is Jesus. Uh, the wedding can easily, I think, be seen as the wedding of the lamb to his bride, the church. You know, what, what we see in, after the final judgment. It's an image that we will eventually see in Revelation. Uh, you may remember Revelation 19.7 uh, through 9, where he says, Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory, for the marriage of the lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, pure and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saint. And the angel said, to me, write this, blessed are those who were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So I think that's kind of the backdrop for that. Now those first invited are either the Jewish leaders who were opposing Jesus or uh, have opposed God throughout the ages or, or perhaps the Jewish people as a whole. Uh, the servants in verse 6 are most certainly the Old Testament prophets who were ignored or mistreated. Now, just like in Luke's parable, the, the first who were invited chose not to come, and they busied themselves doing lesser things, um, if you remember. And, and, and ultimately, that part of the parable concludes that those invited were not worthy. What I want to do today, and we can spend weeks on this, is really talk first just a bit about the first part of the parable, because uh, there are really three parts to it. And, and then look at the last part and some of the layers of difficulty. Verse 7 is short, but it's full of problems. After the servants of the king are mistreated, some are killed, the king responds in one short verse. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burnt their city. Now, that's not exactly how we think about God, is it? But let's be honest. Read the Old Testament. And you see that many times God uses armies in war to accomplish his purpose. Uh, he destroyed the enemies of Israel and chastens his own people. You know, sit down and read the prophets for a while. You can't miss this. Um, and, and a hard part is that it seems that in the first century church, they saw this directly aimed at Israel. Jerusalem and much of the country of Israel was destroyed in the rebellion of 68 AD, probably right around the time when God, Matthew's gospel was being compiled. So to the first generation search, this parable, this verse, probably they thought made a lot of sense in their eyes. And they actually imagined it unfolding in front of their eyes. Now the subsequent cause problem, and I know I've talked about this before, but it needs to be said again and again, is that Christians down the ages have used this scripture along with others to justify anti-Semitism or conversion of, forced conversion of Jews. And I think... That may not exactly be our problem, but we need to keep this issue ever before us and, and realize that anti-Semitism is the first wrong turn in misunderstanding any part of this parable and is, is never justified. We do have a long history to live down. And just like our blind eyes to racial injustice, we need to be vigilant that we never justify mistreating anyone by doing so in God's name. God will judge, not us. We Christians would be lost without the faithful Jewish heritage that we have and our forerunners in their faith. Now, that is not to say that we affirm that Judaism offers a path to God outside of God's son Jesus and his death on a cross. 
It is not anti-Semitism to say that Jews have missed God's promised Messiah and that there may be eternal consequences for that. Um, frankly, this is what this and other teachings of Jesus are quite clear about. It's hard to accuse Jesus of being anti-Semitic. But we can never justify any anger or coercion towards the Jews from anything we find in Scripture. Friends, if there's anything there, that's God's job, not ours. This parable says nothing about punishing Jews for the death of Christ. Now, the final part of the parable. Let me reread it so it's fresh in your mind. Uh, before I do so, let me mention that some commentators, and I, I say these things because I know that some of you are really uh, good students of the Bible. You're going to hear and read and see other things. Suggest that, the, that from verse 11 on, these par were not part of the original parable. That they were from another parable. They were added later to this parable. Now, I think that's at least possible. Matthew does seem to assemble some of his gospel by topic, not by chronology. But, but that doesn't really answer any of the difficult parts here. It just pulls them apart. I assume that everything here was a part of a parable of Jesus, and we're going to treat them as such. <coughs> Excuse me. So, again, um, from verse 8. And then he said, the king said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite them to the wedding feast, as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to look at the guests, he saw a man there who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And kind of literally says, struck dumb. And the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot. Cast him in the outer darkness, in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now I have to say that what happens to this man seems patently unfair to me. I mean, he gets brought to a wedding banquet by the king's servant. But when the king discovers he's not properly dressed, he's bound and cast into hell. I mean, talk about a dress code. Um, I mean, interestingly enough, I'll tell you, you know, Jesus is not the only rabbi who taught parables. Um, not long after Jesus' ministry, we don't know exactly, probably a half century, uh, a Jewish rabbi spoke a similar parable about repentance and preparation. He wrote, It is like a king who invited his servants to a feast but did not appoint them a time. The wise among them adorned themselves and sat by the door of the palace, for they says, is anything lacking in a palace? The foolish went among them to their work, and they said, is a feast ever given without preparation? Suddenly the king summoned his servants. The wise among them went in before him, adorned as they were, and the foolish went before him in their working clothes. The king rejoiced to see the wise and was angry to see the foolish, and said, them who adorn themselves for the feast shall sit down, eat and drink. But those who did not adorn themselves for the feast shall stand and look on. Very similar, huh? Interesting enough, the rabbi who wrote that was from Galilee. So I wonder, what if he'd heard Jesus? Now some suggest that at such feasts, kings would provide wedding cloth, clothes for the guests, and that the man then refused that or snuck in. But actually, there, there's no real evidence that this was a real practice. That said, remember that a, this is a parable of eternal judgment. Um, and like all the parables, no single parable is a complete theology. And I think we need to be careful not to, to draw one as such. Let me give you some insight again from uh, Kyle Snodgrass, who's written on this. It says, regardless of the origins of verses 11 through 13, uh, the reason Matthew includes them is clear. That both the bad and the good were gathered leads to the expectation that they will be separated. See how that ties together in the parable? More than any other Gospels, Matthew consistently reminds his readers that the unlimited grace of the kingdom always brings with it unlimited demand. The emphasis is on obedient response and an awareness of the reality of judgment. Here, the narrative plane of the story is broken by the reality being pictured. The punishment is no longer earthly, such as the disruption of cities, but the final apocalyptic judgment. That the man is expected to have a wedding garment is still troublesome. Apparently all that is intended is a clean garment. To come with dirty clothes would show contempt for the king and his banquet. Matthew's parable does not say that the people came straight from the streets. 
the parable seems to assume that a man had time to come properly attired. Efforts to identify the missing garment have usually focused on good works, repentance, salvation, love, or more generally the eschatological garment awarded to the righteous in a new age. Precise identification is both impossible and inappropriate. And I have to say it's done not in, has been done non-ceasingly for the last 19 centuries. What is important is that the man made no preparation to wear something fitting for the feast he chose to attend. If he is representative, he mirrors all the unrighteous who have made no preparation for God's judgment. The parable then, in its two parts, contains three important themes. The refusal of the religious leaders, the gathering of the kingdom, and the separation that then takes place at the final judgment. And I have to tell you, friends, that as you look at the big picture here, I think there is one Old Testament scripture that sheds a lot of light on this. It's Isaiah 61.10, where he writes, I will, rejoice, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself out like a priest with a beautiful headdress, as a bride adorns herself with her neck jewels. Doesn't that kind of sound like this parable? And remember, a parable is simply a simple story to make a point. But Jesus would have known this verse. And I think in a larger context, it fills in some of the points. That salvation and righteousness are our nonetheless gifts. Gifts God gives to us, not things we attain for ourselves. They can be imagined like a dress of a, of a bride or a groom at a wedding feast. As I mentioned earlier, uh, that is the bride of Christ in the kingdom of God. Those who are invited to attend the banquet are both the guests and the subject of the banquet at the same time. I know for many today, the real troubling point comes when we see someone who may not have been fully aware of the expectations of the banquet being given the ultimate bum rush. I mean, I humbly rejoice in the idea that out of his pure grace, God may have chosen me to sit at you know this table in the coming kingdom, if only for comic relief. Yet I, I too struggle with the idea that others may not have been chosen. Uh, what about the baby in Africa who died as an infant? What about the nice little old lady who was kind to everyone but had nothing to do with God? And the parable ends with a sobering line. You know, for many are called, but few are chosen. Let me, let me quote Snodgrass one more time. It says, finally we must reflect again on judgment. This theme appears repeatedly in Jesus' teaching, and we are always uncomfortable with it. Couldn't God just be a nice God and not hold anyone accountable? Does the concept of judgment negate the promise of salvation? And then this line, without the concept of judgment, one does not even need salvation. And any urgency about life and its importance about justice or even about God, is not, if not lost, is greatly diminished. Grace is only grace if the outcome should have been otherwise. I love that line. And the significance of life depends on accountability for life. We may not like judgment, but it is a central and necessary message of both Testaments, especially the teachings of Jesus. Or as Michael Wilkins writes, therefore, while there is an open invitation to the kingdom, from the divine perspective, it is only God's sovereign choice that affects salvation. From a human perspective, it is only those who respond to the call appropriately that are a part of the banquet. Only an appropriate response reveals God's divine election. So it's still God doing the saving, not us. Whether we understand it all or not. Let me finish with a practical application for a difficult topic that I know that I cannot fully explain. If in the end it's God's choice who belongs at the banquet, then what should we do? Nothing? I think the simple answer is that what we do is invite. We invite everyone. And then we let God worry about the rest. Way back in 2005, we took a small mission team to Antalya, Turkey, to run a children's day camp in the poor rural outskirts of the city. In spite of the language and cultural differences, it was an amazing week, really with one exception. The woman who ran the small local school that we used had something against one little girl 
in the neighborhood. The little girl wanted to come to the program, but the woman told us she could not come and sent her away. It was quite a sad sight. Now, some of you may remember Carrie Barnes, a young woman with a big heart from our congregation who came with us. She saw what was happening. Tears welled up in her eyes, and mild-mannered Carrie stormed out of the school, trotted down the dirt street to where the girl was sitting, and this is actually a picture of it, talked to her, took her by the hand, led her back into the school with an absolute nobody mess with me look on her face. And nobody did. That little girl uh, and Carrie were good friends all week. Now what happened to the little girl? I have no idea. But she was invited to the banquet by a servant of the king. And if a tie-dyed t-shirt is a fit, fitting wedding garment, she just might make it. So friends, invite. Let God worry about the rest. Let's pray. Father, thank you that that we all come to a banquet that um, we're not really fit for. That We're told in Scripture that our our dirty clothes are made white in you by by the blood of Jesus. And and we all come humbly to a place that, that we don't deserve to be. And how that all works out and who gets to stay and who gets to lose is is, is your business, not ours. But help us to be humble and thankful for our invitation and help us to do what you have called your servants to do, and that's invite. We do pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, go out from this place into the world as servants of the King and invite. And may God's grace and mercy and peace and presence be with you now and forevermore. Amen.